Hey guys, this is Raz and I wanted to make an apology and a couple quick announcements before we get to this awesome interview with Eric Erickson. First of all, thank you to so many of you that have reached out saying congratulations on the birth of my son. He joined us on October 1st, about 3.51 in the morning. And so my wife, Jenny, and I have been getting all familiarized with him and all of his fun things and just the, the, the bleary-eyed sleep deprivation that parenthood is here at the beginning. So I'm running on a surprisingly low number of brain cells and a whole lot of caffeine right now. And uh, you, my apology comes from that uh, that sleep deprivation ended up making me jack up last week's podcast. I uploaded the wrong file or something. I'm still not sure what. But if you downloaded it and it happened to only be three minutes long, that was not the full interview. I barely got Lee introduced. Uh, I uploaded the correct file the, on Friday. And so it should be up there. But if you download the first one, you probably have to manually go back and select and re-download that. I would encourage you to do so because there's a lot of awesome information. And I really apologize to Lee and you guys for jacking that up. This is the My Campaign Coach Podcast, where we talk about how to win elections. Every week, we let you hear straight from the best consultants, operatives, and candidates in the game, all for one reason, to help you win. For more information about how we can help you win, visit MyCampaignCoach.com. Now, here's your host, Raj Schaefer. Welcome to the How to Run for Office Podcast from My Campaign Coach. Whether you're joining us for the first time or you've been around since the beginning last November, thank you so much for downloading the podcast. I enjoy producing every week, and I think we're getting out a lot of great information to candidates and campaigns. I'd really appreciate it if you consider giving us a five-star rating on iTunes and subscribing so you never miss a single episode. You get that downloaded straight to your phone or your podcatcher device as soon as it comes out. One of my favorite things about being involved in politics is the incredible relationships you get to build. And I've known this week's guest for nearly eight years, and he's been an incredible supporter of the work that I've done, both at my campaign coach and elsewhere. Eric Erickson is a recovering lawyer and former editor-in-chief at RedState.com. He currently runs the Resurgent.com and is host of the Eric Erickson Show on the nation's most listened to news and talk station, WSB out of Atlanta. He's also a contributor to Fox News. On top of that, if that wasn't enough, he's also one of the chosen few who gets to fill in for Rush Limbaugh behind his golden EIB microphone. The Atlantic Magazine called Eric the most powerful conservative in America, and The Hollywood Reporter named him the most influential conservative blogger on the internet. He's also an author, and we're actually going to spend some time talking about his latest book, Before You Wake, Lessons from a Father to His Children. Eric has been observing, supporting, advising, and commenting on political campaigns for most of his adult life, and it's in this arena where he's built an incredible reputation. But he was also a candidate himself and actually won a city council seat in Macon, Georgia, Georgia's fourth largest city. Eric's a good man, a great friend, and somebody I'm always happy to jump into a political foxhole with. Eric, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Man, I love getting to talk to you. We don't get to do it enough with you living out in Georgia and me here in Texas, but it's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. You're definitely a, a great asset to the movement, and I know you got some good advice for, for campaigns. Let's start out the same we do every week. Tell us a little bit about your story, where you came from, how you got hooked on politics, and what you've been doing these last uh, couple decades. Oh, boy. Um, where to begin with that one? Uh, so, you know, I, I grew up in Dubai. I didn't grow up in the U.S. Uh, my dad worked for an oil company when I was five. Uh, the company said, uh, move overseas or find a new job. So we moved <laughs> overseas. And uh, politics, I mean, we we ultimately we had traditional American sports, baseball and football. Uh, there was more soccer being over there. But it, politics was kind of a way to connect back home. And I, I really developed a love of American politics watching from abroad, uh, got back to the States in high school and started volunteering for just local political campaigns and then got to college. And there was no college Republicans at my alma mater, Mercy University in Macon. And so I started the college Republicans there, uh, totally accidentally fell into becoming the, which is the story of my life, by the way, in politics, uh, it got to become the chairman of the state college Republicans and started running and advising campaigns. When I was a lawyer, I wanted to do political law and election law and started helping a candidate running for Congress. He had a very passive aggressive campaign manager who stopped returning everybody's phone calls, including the candidates. And <laughs> it's a great I, policy. <laughs> I, yeah, I wound up taking over his campaign as the campaign manager and designing the mail and, and doing the polling and finding the consultants to, to steer all this stuff. And it was a great learning experience and then started doing more and more and, and had a, a very good win record, actually. Uh, all of my candidates, except for 
one of them uh, won. And it was just it was interesting to see other people doing it who had no formal training. And I just tried to get as educated as I could on it and then wound up running for office myself. Uh, no one actually ran against me. Uh, it, once I got involved, the only issue I ran on was stopping human trafficking, which was a big issue in Macon at the time. Um, I noticed one night a lot of Asian themed There are probably 10 Asian themed massage parlors that I would pass in the seven minutes it took me to get from my house to downtown Macon. None of them ever were busy. And one night I had to go downtown to be on TV. And literally there, there were lines out the doors at all of them. I was like, what, what is going on? Uh, it's, it's 11 o'clock at night and these places are, are packed and well, a little investigating and connecting with people. I realized, so that was the only thing I ran on and it took me almost my entire first term in office to get laws passed to shut them down. Uh, and once I did that, it was kind of just fortuitous that, uh, or providential, whichever way you want to look at it, radio came calling asking if I wanted a job. I said, yes, but I couldn't be an elected official to have a job in radio because of the way they interpreted FCC rules. I had six months maybe left on my term, so I left early. Very nice. Yeah, that's that's my favorite type of race to run is unopposed. That, that's the very best yeah. kind. <laughs> Got your 100% win rate as a candidate. That's that's the right way to do it. So from there, you, you've, you've done a lot since then. That, that catches us up to the very start of your political work. And from there, you got involved with Red State, and you got on the radio, and then things kind of blew up from there. Yeah, it was it was kind of – again, it's really kind of weird, uh, and I write about this actually in the book, that back in 2004, some buddies of mine started Red State, and they asked – they wanted like 50 bloggers, one for each state, to just write about the politics of that state. And they wanted me to do Georgia, and then they realized I was an elections lawyer, and they needed one of those for free. <laughs> so they gave me more responsibility. And they gave you a it, title in, in exchange for your expertise. It, it basically, I, I was an editor, da, 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 <laughs> and, and the operating officer. Um, in, in November, October 2004, MSNBC had Joe Trippi at the time. This is in the, the rise of blogs. And Joe Trippi wanted bloggers to go to MSNBC and blog the last week of the election. And... So I was the, one of the conservatives they asked, and uh, on my way out the door, one of the partners at my law firm came in and said, do you know what the definition of a dumbass is? And I said, nope. And he just looked at me and said, you, go do politics. <laughs> That's what you want to do. So, I mean, that really started the wheels in motion. A year later, I left practicing law, started doing red state full time, took a job in Washington for about eight months just so I could go up, really connect with people and, and meet people face to face. And then did Red State full time and uh, CNN called in 2009 and the lady who had actually put me on MSNBC was now at CNN and said, do you want a job? Um, and I said, sure. So started at CNN and a year later, uh, Herman Cain decided to run for president and the local radio station in Atlanta was looking for someone to replace him. The head of the station was a Red State reader. Saw I was filling in on the radio in Macon, um, just totally voluntary, never got paid, liked what he heard. And next thing you know, I'm doing TV and radio. <laughs> yeah, much like myself, be in the right place at the right time, working hard and trusting God. That's it's been the, the recipe to your success every step of the way, and I, I absolutely love it. A lot of trusting God in there. Absolutely. Well, and a year ago, you started, about a year and a half ago, actually, you started The Resurgent. You left Red State and started your own outfit with The Resurgent. And you've been on Fox for for how long now? You came off CNN and came to Fox when? Yeah, I, I left CNN in 2013, and I guess I've been at Fox ever since. Gotcha. So you've been doing TV with Fox. You've been doing. You've been writing a couple of books. Your second one just came out. You've got uh, you got the resurgent that's been absolutely blown up and doing great things. And you've been being involved in tracking a lot of the elections and. and writing and observing a ton of candidates from up close, both the ones on the on the national level and the presidential side, as well as a whole lot of folks around the country that you've got to be involved with through Red State and the resurgent and elsewhere. But one of the things that happens a lot when, before we get on to talking about the, the political and the campaign stuff, what I want to go to now is kind of talk about your book. And I know that we're involved in politics because policy outcomes matter to us, but it's really easy to lose sight of the other things in our lives that matter and the other things that need to be higher priorities. I know we've been both been guilty of losing sight of the world outside of politics at times, and your new book is really a result of reorienting some of your priorities the last couple of years. Now, as much as I want our listeners to focus on making a difference in politics, I don't want any of us to lose sight of what really matters. So why don't you tell us a little bit about why you wrote the book and what it's about? 
Sure. Um, so when was it? Uh, in mid April of last year. So I, I had come out in February of last year and said that I, I didn't think uh, faith reasons, policy reasons, convictions. I, I didn't think I could support uh, Donald Trump for president. I uh, wasn't going to vote for Clinton, but just didn't think I could support him. And that that started a series of escalating issues. Um, it, people showing up at my office, people demanding I be fired, people showing literally showing up on our front porch in our house, having to have armed guards, my kids getting yelled at uh, in the grocery store by someone that I was destroying the country, um, on and on and on and on. And um, uh, along the way, it was just harder and harder for me to breathe. I mean, I was literally getting to the point where climbing a flight of stairs – I was out of breath, and this was going on for a while. You know, as I write in my book, actually, as as most stories of pain, misery, and horror begin, it started with CrossFit, uh, <laughs> where I, I was going to go get myself back in shape, and I really liked it, but I couldn't keep up, and I just thought, dang it, I am over 40 now, and I, and I can't keep up anymore. There's a problem, and it just got worse. I, I was going to a trainer then after I couldn't do CrossFit, and uh, we started doing basically CrossFit slowly and I still like I couldn't breathe and finally and it got so bad in the middle of April we're literally putting my head on the pillow at night I couldn't breathe uh, Christy made me go to the doctor wound up getting or rushed into an ICU unit my lungs were filling up with blood clots and as I'm going into the ICU literally going into the ICU that day in April doctors from the Mayo Clinic called and told my wife she needed to come out there for an exam. They were pretty sure she had lung cancer, which we found out six months later she has an incurable form of lung cancer. She takes a pill that keeps everything at bay. Um, wow. So all of this is going on. And, you know, suddenly politics doesn't become really important Absolutely. anymore when you're facing really dying. And, I mean, it, it, the seriousness of the situation literally was hammered home to me when I'm – they're putting IVs in me. And the doctor on the ICU ward sees my chart on the board. It's right outside the room I'm in. And he turns to the nurse and just offhandedly asks if they had taken that body to the morgue yet. And that was, that was me. Yeah. And literally every time I've gone to the doctor since then, the, they pull up my scans and ask me if I know I should be dead. And so I wanted to write a letter to my kids on what I think is important in life, why, who I am, because I, I am the one – parent at my kids Christian school where the teachers lovingly but very laughingly tell me that they know I'm the guy they can't Google to show kids how internet search engines work. Um, <laughs> and it, you know, if my kids Google them, I mean, they would find out a lot of bad things I did, but they would find out more about what people who don't like me think of me right. than who I really am, people who don't know me. Uh, and it, they wouldn't know, for example, our family recipes. So the, the book is in part a cookbook with all their favorite recipes. That's awesome. Um, but also what they, I think they need to know about God and life and why they were raised the way they were raised. It, it has nothing at all to do with politics. That's really incredible. And I mean, that's, that's a struggle that, I mean, I'm, as we record this, I'm, you know, minutes, if not days away from having my first child and, you know, God only knows when. It'll be a couple of weeks old when this thing comes out, hopefully, if he ever decides to come out. My wife's pretty sure that he's not going to. He's just going to hang out there for a couple more months or years or how until she dies, one or the other. But I, uh, I've, I've really spent a lot of time, you know, knowing your story and, and knowing my passion for politics. And with the son coming, I've really spent a lot of time thinking about some of those things myself. Uh, I, I incidentally am naming my son William Stonewall. And I think I picked the worst possible t you know, point in American history to name your kid after a Civil War general because of what people will assume about you. So that, that's going to be fun. But I was, I, I'm in the process of writing a, a post that may be up by the time this thing comes out at the resurgent, just talking about why I'm naming this. And it's, it's largely a, a letter to my, to my son saying, hey, why in the world would you name me this? And explaining you know, why that's important to me. And uh, so if it's out by the point this podcast comes out, we'll link to in the show notes. But I really have a great passion for making sure that as I'm raising my son, that I make sure he has a well-balanced set of priorities. Of course, I wanted to be active in the public sphere and having an impact publicly wherever God wants him to be, but it's more important to me that he's a good man, a strong Christian, that he, he is just a good person and a, and a valuable friend to those around him. If you don't get those things right, then one, you're not going to have the political impact you could, but two, uh, you shouldn't waste time over in that sphere. And so I think that for the candidates, for the, for the staffers or consultants that are listening, my hope is that they'll they'll check out your book, which we link to in the show notes, and that they will 
uh, they'll kind of learn from some of those things because we need more and more people as far as conservatives go, especially being involved in the public sphere. But how we engage there is really, really important. And that's, that's part of you know, what got you to start The Resurgent. So tell us a little bit about you know, what The Resurgent is, why you, know, why you started that, and what, what this resurgent culture that you're trying to help build is all about. Well, you know, it, it this has been a the research. It was a long time coming. I, I started it January of 2016, and one of the main reasons I did it, honestly, was a business decision. In that, uh, back in 2006, I guess it was, yeah, 2006, uh, the friends of mine and I who owned Red State uh, decided to sell it to Eagle Publishing, and so from 2007 until 2014 ish. Um, Eagle Publishing owned Red State, and I worked for them, and it was all well and good, and then it got bought by Salem Radio. Very good people, but their radio properties compete with the station that has my radio show in Atlanta, and I didn't want to leave them to go to Salem, and we ran into problems along the way of my ability to integrate my radio show and Red State together uh, in the way that I wanted to, and I was tired of... Uh, managing egos and dealing with bosses and bureaucracy and, and all of the hassles that came with it. And I just decided, you know, I want to go back to doing my own thing, writing my own thing where I want to write about what I want to write on my schedule and experiment with integrating radio into it and, and any TV that I do. So I told them in mid uh, June, actually it was June 3rd. It was my uh, 40th birthday I emailed my bosses and said, you know, I, I want out. Uh, I'm happy to stay until our Red State gathering this year, but I really like to leave after that. And they asked me if I would stay till the end of the year, so I did. And January 1st, 2016, flipped on the lights at the resurgent and probably would never have done it had I known 2016 would go the way. <laughs> uh, just health-wise, security-wise, everything else. It, it was a hell of a ride for the last year and a half, but I'm glad I did it. It's it's nice to be back to doing my own thing and writing when I want to write. And, and yes, I have writers. You're one of them uh, who, who write occasionally at the resurgent. And I, I don't do management. It's just if you want to write, write when you want to write. Um, and I like that. I like being able to focus on radio. I'm one of the rare people who went from the Internet to TV and radio as opposed to TV and radio to the Internet. And I really am at a point now in my career where I've just got to think, you know, I'm I used to be a guy with the website who had a radio show. And now I'm a guy with the radio show who has a website. Um, but the whole idea of, of focusing on the resurgent is I had become increasingly mindful in my final years at Red State that we do have this massive conservative movement. Uh, and the ideas are very shaky and the fo intellectual foundations, despite all these great intellectual voices, uh, it's not really there. It's very tribal. And I think 2016 showed it to be that way. And I would much rather focus on a resurgent family and conservatism and, and even Christianity in the country than just the run of the mill daily grind of conservative politics. Well, and you can go to the resurgent.com to find out everything from Eric's favorite recipes and how to make his awesome cinnamon rolls to you know, current political topics of the day and, and uh, you know, long treatises on theoretical or uh, existential or religious stuff that myself and others write up there. There's a great team of writers and there's always good stuff coming out every day from the from the show notes and the podcast that Eric puts up of his radio show and everything else. It's a, it's a great destination and I hope you guys will check out. Now, as you've gone through this voluminous history of, of working around campaigns, uh, you started a lot of that near Macon, Georgia. It's where you where you grew up, where you, or once you got back from from overseas. And now, well, let me stop you there and say, so I, I'm actually a Louisiana native and grew up before we moved to Dubai and then back. Uh, but man, I lived through the Edwin Edwards David Duke race in 1991. Oh, good lord. That was my parents had the bumper sticker on the back of their car, vote for the crook, it's important. Uh, lifelong Republicans. <laughs> they were out campaigning for the Democrat against the the, uh, the KKK guy. And I just like, you know, th this, this place is screwed up. I got to get out of here. And uh, when I had the opportunity to leave, I was literally the only person I know of from my graduating class that left the state to go to college. And never really regretted it. <laughs> well, and you pretty much have stayed in Macon ever since, right? 
Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I met my wife, and we, we love the area. And I, I started my law practice here, went to law school here, and it just it, it became home over time. That's really cool. Uh, and from the consulting on races to you being a city councilman, I mean, you didn't have to run much of a campaign since you're unopposed. You know, my favorite kind. But let's go. Let's go on ahead to talking about political campaigns and some of the lessons you've learned there, because you've got to observe everything from the the presidential level campaigns up close and knowing. I mean, heck, you knew on a personal level more, well over half of the the candidates, the presidential candidates that ran last cycle, and you've been heavily involved in national and, and local politics for a long time. You know. What are some of those things that you've learned about the type of people we need running for office, the, the intangibles or, or parts of their resume that really stand out as far as we need these types of people to be running as conservatives? Well, you know, one of the advices I give to my kids in the book that I gave to candidates is do what's right, not what's liked. Uh, and sometimes it's very hard when you're a candidate because the polling tells you um, the people like this, but you want to do that. Um, one of the other things I tell them, and honestly, the, the number one piece of advice I always gave candidates, it was the second piece of advice that I gave them. I, I always gave them a standard talk. And the second piece of advice was always to um, know when you're in the minority on a position, even if you think you're right. Um, because a lot of people get in their heads that they think X is the greatest thing ever and everybody else likes Y instead. And they need to understand and, and have an honest assessment of the fact that, you know, most people disagree with you on this. Your circle of friends may agree, but most people don't. So don't right. go out thinking everybody's going to immediately embrace this. Uh, the first piece of advice I actually gave them as a political consultant is uh, one of the most arrogant things, particularly an early 20 something can do. But I still stand by it is you, the candidate, are a lump of clay. You don't say anything or do anything or dress in any sort of way except for the way I tell you, uh, because you may be the candidate who thinks you're your own man, but you don't have a clue about how to get yourself elected. And I do. And it, I, I mean, I started that at a very young age and it came across as extremely obnoxious for a 22 year old to tell a <laughs> six year old that. Uh, but at the same time, it, it really dawned on them that, you know, this this kid actually does know how to get me elected. And it worked. In all but one case, uh, it worked. And being able to sit down with them and, and make sure they know, first of all, there are a lot of terrible political consultants out there who like to bleed people dry. Uh, and second, um, they need to surround themselves with people who are going to tell them exactly what they don't want to hear because they're going to get surrounded by people who tell them exactly what they want to hear. One of the best pieces of advice I ever got when I got into radio, actually, is from Rush, uh, who told me I need to have someone on my staff at all times who can tell me when I've screwed up. Because if my career goes the way he hoped it would, I would get to a point where no one in the entire world that I came into contact with would ever tell me that. And I need at least one person willing to do it. And uh, you've met my, my producer, Charlie, who relishes playing the <laughs> to, to my radio show. Yeah, between Charlie and Philip, I feel like you've got those good yeah, ego much balloon so. poppers nailed down on your staff. <laughs> Well, and I think it's really important to to kind of build off what you're saying from the from your as a campaign manager. You're hiring a campaign manager or consultant for a reason. You're hiring them because they know something that you don't, and they're able to give you advice that you can't get on your own because you don't know that you haven't been here through this before. And it's important to hire them after a lot of thought and looking at them and interviewing them, and then really listen carefully what they're saying, only disregard that advice after very careful consideration because they're going to be the ones that are putting thought into the things like, well, what do you wear? How do we say this? And making sure that you understand where, you, where you're where you at as far as the majority or minority viewpoint. Because it may be, and you and I both have experience have, you know, being in the minority on an important viewpoint, and that may be the right thing. We may believe that's the thing we got to push, but the way you communicate that is going to be different when you're in the minority than the majority. And you got to be aware of your surroundings and how you're positioned there both on the issue and among the population in order to be able to actually try to communicate that effectively and win people to your side. Yeah. It, you know, I'm, I'm not a big Dick Morris fan. Uh, and I never have been. Uh, but one of the best pieces of pieces of, uh, political theory and advice I ever heard from anyone was, uh, Dick Morris on how to use polls that a lot of candidates and even strategists, they misunderstand how to use polls. Um, uh, no one should ever use a poll to tell them what to do. A poll should be used to tell you how to do what you want to do. Uh, 
Absolutely. Uh, that was the advice he gave Bill Clinton is don't say, oh, a majority of people want to do this. Let me pivot here. It's I want to do X, Y, and Z. Figure out a way for me to communicate to people in a way that will connect with them. And, and that's what you use polling for. Uh, there is a, a lot of uh, inductive reasoning and not deductive reasoning that goes into it as well. You, you've got to really – you got to be perceptive and uh, when you're out there and be able to connect with people and read their emotions to know what they want. And you've got to be unafraid to tailor your messages to particular groups. Um, you know, you're in this day and age, everybody's so micro targeted. You're not going to be able to convince 51 percent of the people on the same message. And, and that's not me saying, well, tell people one thing here and the opposite there. It's no. These people care about schools. But these people care about their roads, and this group over here cares about crime. Uh, tailor a message to each of them. Well, and I think that ties in really well with what the campaign platform that you ran on being human trafficking. Uh, we talked a couple weeks ago with Lee Vache talking about polling and how to discover some of these these 80 percent issues where everybody agrees on something, but it's not really being talked about and the value of being able to to test some of those issues. Uh, you know, in your case, even if you had an opponent, you had discovered an issue that was there that was ready for the taking that, frankly, if you had had an opponent would have probably helped you win you know, in spite of that competition, because you took an issue that, I mean, nobody's in favor of human trafficking except those carrying it out. Right. So, right. you know, that would have been a huge thing that you not only discovered, but you then promoted and said, I'm the guy, I'm the anti-human trafficking guy. And it wasn't, a, you weren't talking about, hey, we got to, we, the, the biggest issue is cutting taxes or roads or the things that city council folks typically talk about those, those top four issues. When we look at, you know, partisan campaigns outside of the city side, it's really easy to get locked into those top three or four issues, basically whatever the national issues are. You can look at every candidate's website and it's basically all copied and pasted across the board as far as issue set goes. What, what they talk about, immigration, national security, taxes, budget, religious liberty. I mean, that, that's pretty much on any Republican's website now. That's what's there. And, and the, the answers they have for all that is the same. Yeah. It comes down to having a unique brand in a lot of cases to set you apart. And I think that the 2016 race really put this on display because we had 17, uh, you have 16 guys in Carly up there running for president. And the vast majority of them were saying the exact same thing. Their records were different, but they were saying nearly exactly the same thing. And we saw that a couple of the guys that got the farthest and the guy who ended up winning the White House were saying things at least differently than other folks. And we're, they were picking up some of those issues that people outside the Beltway cared about and talking to them in ways that they wanted more. You had, you had Cruz and Trump that both you know came the closest to the finish line. Trump obviously won. What are some of the lessons that you think folks need to take away from 2016 as far as how it applies to, to down-ballot races especially? Probably uh, that you need to remember that there are there's a thing out there that you call voter and that that thing called voter is actually a human being and that human being has real life concerns and worries and your your slick packaging probably isn't going to resonate with them. And at this point in the American Republic. People have become so cynical of politics uh, that they expect everybody to say the exact same thing, do the exact same thing, wear the exact same tie, have the exact same hairstyle. So the guy that stands out um, is going to be the guy who resonates. And that doesn't mean you've got to be uh, blustery and a jerk. It means that you've got to really understand that it, because everybody's going one way doesn't mean you have to go that way at, as well. And to his credit, I think Donald Trump understood that from the moment he got off the escalator, that uh, he was going to talk about the issues no one else was going to talk about, and he was going to suck the oxygen out of the room on those issues. And they were issues that people cared about greatly but weren't getting talked, like the wall. Yeah, he, he did a great job of sucking every bit of oxygen out when it came to, to those big issues and really bringing them up before – anybody else was comfortable with them. I mean, Cruz was talking about immigration early on. Nobody else was. Jeb Bush didn't want to talk about immigration. You know, he, he brought it up, and because of his the earned media that he was getting, he was able to make that the number one issue and, and really kind of drag those other guys from issue to issue throughout the campaign trail. I think a lot of, a lot of candidates, especially like state house level and, and some of the lower levels of partisan office, I think they learned the exact wrong lesson for 2016. And many of them, it seems, you know, when you look at their Facebooks and stuff, their lesson for 2016 was you got to be Trump. You have to be exactly like him in your in your tone, in everything about it. 
uh, in some of their cases, even down to wearing trucker hats, which just drives me nuts. But yeah. w- when you when you get out there, that seems to be the lesson they learned. You know, from from my side, I think that the lesson is that you've got to be strong in your own brand. You you cannot be like everybody else. You have to stand out on your own. But it doesn't have to be, you know, making sure yourself a carbon copy of Trump. As a matter of fact, it shouldn't be. If that's not who you are, then don't try to be something that you're not. Identify yeah. who you are and and build a strong brand there. We've got a guy in Georgia running for governor who's actually, I, I mean, I supported him in a primary against an incumbent, a powerful incumbent Republican, and he won. And he's a very nice guy. But he was the his political consultant worked for Trump at the beginning of the campaign, and he convinced. Uh, this candidate to go out early and support Trump, and he did, and now he's decided to run for governor as the Trump candidate. And the way he's interpreted that as he's got a whole protest in front of schools and and find grievances and and be just bombastic, and that's not who he is. And it comes across to people that that's not who he is, and he doesn't come across as comfortable doing it. Uh, and but that's the way he's doing it because he's he's trying to corner the market and. You know, to his credit, he's been able to corner the market with some of the real diehards who are so embittered and passionate um, that, I mean, you you throw them one bone and they're going to come with you. But uh, the more discerning voters probably aren't going to go that way because they they get this isn't really authentic with with Donald Trump. Say what you will about him, but everybody knew he believed what he said. Uh, And you can't say that about some of the candidates who are pretending to be him. Well, and that ties back into what you said near the beginning of, you know, when you look at polling and some of those things, they're not to tell you what to say and what to believe. It's all about helping you figure out how to communicate it. And so when you're looking at Trump's success or even the success of other candidates, whether it's a Roy Moore or whoever else, the idea is not to just copy what they're doing and their issue set and their however they're doing things. It's figure out what yours is. And you're, the consultants and the campaign managers and advisors you have around you should not be telling you to be somebody different than you are. They should be helping you figure out how to communicate your values, your brand, and what you believe better. It's refining the, the process, the approach, the tactics side of what you believe. You, you translate your principles and your policy positions into an effective means of communication. You put it through that effective means. And on the other side, you come across something that voters are actually going to enjoy care about and and hopefully grab onto well you would like to think that (laughs) that's the trick that's the rub it it works that way um but you know there are times i think candidates really get tempted they they get frustrated and they encounter the person in fact you know i i get this in radio where one guy shows up at every live broadcast And he has the same complaint every time. (laughs) And if you're not if you're not grounded in your own personality and who you are, at some point, there's a temptation to give in to that and say, well, I mean, this guy's that passionate. He must be speaking for other people. You know, there's that theory that if there's a letter in the editor of this person's probably speaking for 100 like minded people. Well, if this guy showed up with that much passion, there must be 100 other people. Maybe I should go that way. No, Um, don't. Don't try to be someone you're not and just have real passion for the issues. Now, one of the other things is is don't try to have passion for an issue you don't understand or that's going to blow up in your face. One of the things that we've seen a lot of is uh, in the news lately is this uh, this bandwagon jumping when it comes to an issue. And we had the conserv- the, uh, the Confederate monuments not too long ago. We've got all the football protests right now. And everybody on Facebook, you know, whether they have any political standing or elected or have a business, well, everybody has to put something up about the football protests, whether they're for or against and about uh, it, thanks, it's, it's crazy. I got to I got to go into Facebook right now and, and change my picture. To <laughs> but I like your podcast. Nice. Well, <laughs> I, I tell you what, it's it's. It's something that I think a lot of candidates are drawn to because they see what the hot topic is. And those are just two examples of stuff everybody, it seems, has jumped onto. But what what I'm seeing right now is that I think there's a, it's a trap that a lot of candidates fall into. You know, when you're looking at those hot issues, do you see a downside in, in jumping in there into that fray when, when you're somebody that really can't impact it and when everybody's jumping on? Yes. Um, you know, one of the greatest political campaigns – for president in modern American history is that of George W. Bush uh, in 2000. And I acknowledge up front in saying that, that he lost the popular vote. But the reason it was such a good campaign is because they did what you were supposed to do. What I did with every candidate 
is I sat down and we brainstormed on all of the positive characteristics of the candidate and then all of the negative characteristics of the candidate. And then we decided who is most likely going to be your challenger. And we did a strengths, weaknesses, uh, SWOT analysis of, of what set the candidate apart from the opposition uh, so that we could form a compelling message. And inevitably it pops out every time you do it. Uh, you do your strengths in, in versus his weaknesses on both sides, and it pops out, this is the message that's going to set me apart. Yeah. And what was George W. Bush's uh, message? It was, the middle class has been forgotten and help is on the way. Mm -hmm. And you would get into a debate with Al Gore, and they would ask a question about global warming, and Al Gore would give this glorious scientific uh, answer complete with footnotes in, in every utterance. And <laughs> George W. Bush would say, yep, that's all nice, but, you know, we've forgotten the middle class and help is on the way. We've we've forgotten the soldier and help is on the way. And, and yeah, maybe we need to do that, but we've forgotten the middle class and help is on the way. And it's setting apart. Everybody knew George W. Bush at the end of that campaign, help is on the way. And candidates get distracted by the daily news cycle. They've got a message. Um, I, I The only campaign I ever lost was the campaign where we flew by the seat of our pants and the candidate insisted that we respond to everything that the other candidate was doing. Well, that put us on defense. We were never on offense. Every other campaign I ever did, I made the candidate sit down with his wife and his best friends who could just crap on him for two or three hours. Every little nitpicky thing they hate about him come out. Uh, it's going to get you used to having thin skin. And then all the things they like about him and then chart them all out in relation to who they think the other guy is going to be. And inevitably you find out that this is what sets you apart from that guy. And from that, you always I've never had it not work where you actually get what your message and talking point is. And then you can relate it to every single issue. You, you think churches are under attack? Well, help is on the way. You think your, your kids are getting a bad education? Well, help is on the way. And it becomes your motto. It becomes how you package every issue. And I'm always shocked when I encounter people who run campaigns and they haven't done that. I mean, I know back when I was doing campaigns, I would know what I planned on spending money on the last week of the campaign in the first week of the campaign. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, th that boggles my mind and is a huge part of why I ended up starting my campaign coach is because I think there's so much work that you should do and can do at the beginning of a campaign before you ever stand, stand next to a podium and announce that you can do so much to determine whether you're going to win or lose before you spent a single nickel, let alone put out a single press release. And doing that kind of SWOT analysis, that's that's like module one in the advanced candidate course we do. That's one thing that we talk about all the time on the podcast and say, look, you've got to understand who you are, what you believe, who the other guy is, what they believe, and really understand the differences between you two. Because it doesn't matter how awesome you are or how bad they are. If you cannot de demonstrate a difference, you know, what the, what the difference between the two as far as the outcomes a voter gets, then you're not going to be able to win because that they look at that in terms of contrast, right? It's, it's all about not just who you are, but what does that look like in terms of this other guy? How, how good you are is in their eyes is largely determined by how bad they think the other guy is and vice versa. Yeah, very much so. And the, when you don't have that mapped out, and frankly, when you don't do a fair and honest assessment of yourself, mm -hmm. really going to be called off guard. Um, it, you know, so my, one of my favorite stories, and uh, I'm just I'm going to tell the story like it is. My apologies in advance. <laughs> I, I, you, you'll understand here. We, the the campaign that I worked on, where I essentially became the manager, I, I was initially the lawyer. And helped get the campaign off the ground. I was invited in to do a SWOT analysis, which hadn't been done before. And the, the consultant knew enough to do it. And it was a candidate who was a small businessman who started a very successful publishing company. And he was also a pastor. And they decided, his friends around the table decided they were going to run him as the honest, trustworthy preacher. People are so cynical in politics. And I just said, wait, wait a second here. You've got a publishing company that publishes books for liberal Baptists, including at least one book that essentially built the theological case for gay marriage uh, back in the early 2000s. And I said, this is going to come back. And if you run as the honest preacher, man, 
that is like uh, you wouldn't need the art of war and Sun Tzu to undermine your campaign. Right. All you got to do is raise one or two ethical issues about you. People are so cynical of preachers and politics and, oh, no, no big deal. We'll throw enough money at it. Da, 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 da. Well, it, it didn't work out that way. What They started the opponent, started passing out materials that his publishing company had published. Uh, why is a preacher publishing this? Why is a preacher having his publishing company go to these events? And I'll never forget, we were, we were this was, K, um, Club for Growth was on K Street at the time. Uh, and we're walking across, we had stayed at the Jefferson Hotel, we're walking down uh, towards K Street. And we're in the middle of K Street, and the candidate who's 6'6", very tall guy, I'm 5'10", uh, almost a foot taller than me. In the middle of K Street, in the crosswalk, he's he's flustered. He, his campaign's running out of money. He's he's having to basically foot the bill for his campaign. He stops and he turns around and he just points at me, and he says, "I'm going to tell you what. If we don't win this thing, and I ever run for Congress again, I will not run as the goddamn preacher." <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I mean, to to have the the preacher say that. I just thought, you know, this is exactly why you're going to lose. Yeah. Uh, and sure enough, we got into a runoff. And in the runoff, every single bit of character attack that could be launched on him uh, against his values because he was supposedly a preacher and yet was publishing all the stuff uh, came out and he was annihilated in the runoff. Couldn't I mean. He was defined in the runoff in the first week of the runoff, which actually has been my strategy in runoff since is the moment you get into a runoff, you beat the hell out of the other guy and, and get his voters to stay home, which is a very successful strategy in a runoff, not necessarily in a, in a primary. But you, yeah, if you don't do that, if you don't have an honest assessment of it, you're going to wind up standing in the middle of K Street, uttering expletives, taking the Lord's name in vain that you should have never <laughs> done this. Yeah, that's one of the biggest things I look at with candidates is it, is if you're not willing and capable of, of taking a good look at yourself. And actually, you know, the first question is not, and this is the opposite of most candidates take it. The first question is not what's going to matter to voters that might be negative in my background. It's simply what's negative in my background. What are all the potential things that from that anybody could possibly the most Republican conservative Christian hating social justice warrior on the left. What what's the thing they could take and spin? with the help of BuzzFeed or anybody else to, to make negative about me. It, it's like we're taking worst case scenarios and you know, most people it doesn't take actually going all the way to worst case scenarios to find stuff, but we, we want to be exhaustive about figuring out what are all the potential threat vectors. I mean, if you're, when you're in the military, if you're do, if you're going in to protect a base or taking up a patrol post, the first thing you do is you analyze your potential liabilities, not just from the perspective of what's likely, but what's possible. And then you assign likelihoods to it. I mean, you're, that's how you start to figure out Okay, what, what do we need to prioritize as far as our responses and playing those things out? Uh, there was a, a John Lapp who does a bunch of a bunch of work with Intel's doing uh, vulnerability assessments and Oppo research. We had him on the podcast a couple months ago, and he, he told a story about a, I think it was up in Illinois. There was a state house candidate that one of their folks was running against, and he was making his whole campaign about pushing back against Obamacare. But yet they found that there was a resolution where this guy it was it looked like a throwaway vote at the time but this guy literally voted in support of obamacare and but yet yeah, he, he didn't remember it that way he didn't remember casting the vote in the first place and he was running as the anti obamacare guy well it didn't take much longer than that you know, that search to find out oh yeah we got him mhm mm and that that type of thing is out there in a lot of people but you don't if you don't do the vulnerability assessment you're not going to see it. If that candidate had actually done a good vulnerability assessment, he would have seen that, and he wouldn't have been running on this. The hit put his whole weight out over anti-Obamacare. It would have been on something else, and he wouldn't have been as vulnerable. In your case with the preacher man, he wouldn't have run as the preacher man in the first place yeah. and wouldn't have been as open to those attacks. He would have totally closed off those options to his opponents. And it's always amazing to me the people who they don't run a background check on themselves and there's stuff they've forgotten that comes out that was completely avoidable. I can't tell you the number of candidates I've encountered, even at the national level, at the presidential level even, who said, oh, there's there's no reason to pay money to do this. Uh, oh. Yes, there is. Yes. Well, and you just want to know what's out there. The other guy's going to do it. You want to see it in the same format and the same black and white that they do. I mean, in some cases, if you're if you're to find out that there's a, there's a ding out there on you for being late on your taxes or having a lien or something like that, 
well, at least find out what's going to show up because maybe that's maybe that's an error and an error you can get fixed if that was on there wrongly. If so, get it fixed and wait for them to, to slam you with it and then be like, look, they screwed up. I didn't do it. Good luck. Try again. But you got to know what's out there in order to be able to figure out you know what's correct and what are they going to try to use against you. I mean, it's just it's simple stuff, but people forget about it because it's often not comfortable. Yeah, very much so. People block it out of their mind. Uh, they 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 forget it happened. It happened so long ago. Yeah, and you, you know the other thing as well is, and this is increasingly it's sad, but in the age of social media, it's necessary. Is what about your kids? Um, Absolutely, kids have been putting on social media. Yeah, and I mean, and I mean I've been on Twitter since two thousand and nine. I've got thirty or uh, thirty or fifty thousand or some you know, ungodly number of tweets. I need to get a life, but. There's there's a whole lot of stuff out there. I can't remember all what I've said. I mean, if I right. ran for office, somebody would have to go back through those and see what the stupid things that I've said are and make sure we're aware of it, catalog that stuff, maybe delete some of them. Because, I mean, I'm pretty careful on there, but I'm sure I've said some stuff that was stupid that I, I might not even believe anymore. Well, you know, I, I'm thinking when I say that offhand of a, a candidate in Georgia who ran last term, I think, as a, a family values candidate, and their senior in high school was on Instagram with an unprotected account, uh, putting up uh, things in defense of gay marriage and, and Christians are bigots and on and on and on. And it it blew up the candidate. And and the candidate said he tried to do the my kid and I disagree on this thing, but by then the damage was done. And uh, I I hate that kids get dragged into their pres- their their parents campaigns. But in this day and age, it's unavoidable that stuff like that is going to happen. And you're I would first of all, I look, I, I have done a, a podcast of my own recently, having talked to a bunch of people with my my 12 year old now getting to the point of, of cell phones and social media and what is good and isn't. And I, I would never allow my kids to have open, unprotected social media accounts to begin with. In this day and age, um, but if you're running for politics, it's a whole different ball game, and you run the risk, frankly, of your kids resenting you because of it. Yeah, and let's let's talk a little bit more about you know family and running for office. Uh, you know, one of the things on uh, on top of what what you mentioned there is that you know, how a family responds. Because uh, I, I know if I'm if I'm running for office, I'm prepared. I know that I'm going to get attacked. I may not like the way it happens or like what they use against me, but I know that somebody's going to slap me once in a while. It's going to happen. Uh, my family, on the other hand, they're going to probably have a different type of reaction. You know, my wife's going to see red when she sees a Google alert or sees something come across Facebook about somebody saying something nasty about me. My my dad's going to get all mad. Um, they're going to not. It's not the same. It's not them getting attacked as their family member. And I know I sure as heck would be mad, madder than hell if somebody said something like that about my dad or my wife or my brother. So, talk about how you kind of talk to candidates about how they prepare their family and what the right way to react in those types of circumstances are. You know. I always tell them the exact same story. Um, I will, I, I, I will I'll, I'll leave their names out of it, but I, I worked for a member of Congress for a number of years helping on campaigns. And his, uh, he ran for office twice, got elected the second time. Uh, the first time ran against a real gentleman. This was before 94 in the big wave. He, and he ran against, it was just a class act Democrat who would have been a Republican uh, a few years later. In fact, I think he did become a Republican and they, they were both class acts. And then it, when he ran the second time, he ran in the wave in 94 and uh, the district was clearly shifting in his direction. And he ran against a Democrat who decided to just be as nasty as possible the entire campaign uh, and try to hold on uh, to the slipping Democratic grip. And, and the wave came over the guy and, and, my candidate won, and I'll never forget, look, four or five years later, the guy I worked for was on a stage uh, with the man who had beat him, or with the man he had beaten, who had run the nasty campaign, and I'm driving his wife, and she does, she won't clap when, when that guy speaks. Uh, she won't do anything, and she claps for her husband, but she won't do anything, and she finally leans over at me, and she says about her husband, you know... I'm glad that it's him and not me because he can move on from these things. But I am the candidate's wife and I get to hate that son of a bitch the rest of his life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Okay. I got you. And, and she, to this day, 
if if his name comes up, you can hear the venom in her voice. And it is it, it is something like I mean, my wife in what I do, uh, I've got to have a very thick skin. And I tell my wife, please don't ever get online and look at what people are saying. It's just going to piss you off. And occasionally a friend of hers tries to get her worked up over something and sends her a link. And I'm like, one, that's not your real friend. And two, you've got to let it go. And she can't. And it is the the burning passion there. And, and so a candidate needs to understand that uh, they're going to have to respond differently um, in order to to get along and not have a meltdown. Uh, but also they're going to need to respond. Uh, they're going to need to understand and their spouse is going to need to understand that they can't bring that to bed every night. And they may be pissed off at the other side at an attack. They may be mad at the way the candidate isn't responding to defend the family name. And they're just going to have to show some grace and forgive it. Uh, there is a lot of grace that a candidate's spouse and children must have before a campaign starts. Yeah, I think that every every candidate, when you're considered running for office, part of that, that consideration and conversation with your spouse, which they have to be 100% on board, you have to be open and honest to them about what this is going to be like, that has to be a big part of the conversation. They say, look, people are going to say nasty things about me. It doesn't matter whether you're running for school board or city council. I mean, frankly, they're probably going to say nastier stuff at that level than when you're running for state office or, or federal. Oh, they, it, you it's know, awful. Local are the nastiest campaigns. They really are. Yeah, I mean, you got to know that's coming. You got to have a conversation with your spouse. And if your kids are old enough, then with them as well. In my case, I would talk to my parents and my brothers, you know, talk to them and say, look, this is what's going to be happening. How are we going to handle that? Here's how I want you guys to handle that. Here's the process. Okay, you see something? Let me know. Don't respond to it. We'll figure out how to respond together if there's an appropriate response. If not, your goal, part of your commitment as far as the first way you're going to support me that you're going to guarantee you're going to support my campaign is by shutting up. Yes. Yeah, I, you know, they, we had a situation in the 6th Congressional District race, the, the John Ossoff race that Democrats tried to nationalize where one of the candidates who did not make it through the Republican primary got in trouble because his brother was attacking very nastily uh, Karen Handel on their Facebook page. And it became a news story that the, the brother was out there savaging her. Yeah, and I mean, the media gets to go wild with that because it doesn't matter whether you told your brother to go do that or you begged him not to. It's still your brother. It's still your campaign. It's still your fault because, right. I mean, you're responsible for that if it happens. And so you want to make sure that you have your family on board and those around you that are close that could be labeled as your agents that, hey, guys, this is how we're going to handle this. And it's really, really important. If there's nasty stuff being said, you're not liking that stuff on Facebook, you know, just don't just stay away from the race unless we talk about we have a plan. Because you got, you know, when you're looking at these races, being consistent in, in your planning is key. And talking and thinking through responses, whether it's the candidate talking with his consultant or his you know, campaign manager ahead of time, or the spouse, the brother talking with the you know, with the, the candidate, you got to have those conversations because fast reactions are important, but if you get it too fast, you're going to be reckless. And that's where a lot of errors, unforced errors occur. Yeah, very much so. So yeah, I want to go back to, you know, kind of staying on the, the, the idea of vulnerability assessment and negative stuff. Uh, you mentioned George W. Bush's campaign earlier, and and one of the big things that that rocked the boat for him was when his DUI came out late, you know, October of the campaign, and nearly just de derailed his entire campaign and caused him major problems. And since then, I think it, Carl Rove and he have both in their in their books or at least public comments since said that that was something they should have detonated early on, because you've yeah. got a couple of choices. Once you do your vulnerability assessment, you have the negatives, the, the maybe there's bad stuff in your past that you need to that you may be hit with. And some of those things you hope nobody brings up, and but you have a plan for what to do if they do. And other thing is you want to do a controlled detonation on and bring up early on. And so they waited for that thing to blow up, and it really blew up a lot bigger than they thought. Right. But, and in and fact, there have been several studies that have said that probably did actually cost him the popular vote. Yeah, I absolutely believe it. I mean, they the Gore campaign did a great job waiting, biding their time, and detonating that late in the campaign when he was – already known as this trustworthy, compassionate guy that's bringing help on the way, like you said. So when you're looking at those things, at some of those vulnerabilities, what are some of the questions you'd be asking yourself or the considerations to take into account as you're figuring out, do we just hold it? Do we detonate it? What do we do with these things now that we know that they're out there? I think the number one thing is, um, can you use it as a strength? Um, Take, for example, the a, a guy who voted for Obamacare and wants to run against it is, say I was wrong 
up front uh, in, in your campaign statement. I, I'm going to undo the damage done sort of thing. I think probably the textbook example of this is I believe it's Jim Inhofe from Oklahoma. Well, one of one of the the yeah, I think it's Inhofe who was a small businessman who went bankrupt and decided to run for office. And he actually in his campaign like opening speech laid bare his soul that I, I'm running for office because I was a small businessman and I had to file for bankruptcy. I had to file for bankruptcy because oh, we couldn't compete with the taxes, the regulation, on and on and on and on. And I know what it's like to lose your livelihood and go through bankruptcy and people shouldn't have to go through that. And it resonated with people. What could have been a real negative for his campaign and attack on fiscal irresponsibility and whatnot became the entire reason he was running for office. Yeah, incidentally, I actually just gave that same advice to a candidate like two weeks ago. Uh, somebody called me up and I was talking to him. He had a bankruptcy and some problems there. And I think that really, especially if you're transparent about it, you show that you've learned the lesson and made things right. That could be a huge win with voters because you're, you're being authentic. You're being vulnerable. Um, you're not trying to be that guy with the perfect suit and the right tie for TV and just no problems in your past. You're, you're one of them. Uh, I mean, we've talked about a lot in the podcast, but, you know, Voters want somebody that's like them, that shares their values, that's smarter than them, but doesn't act like it. And when you're showing that you're like them, especially a small business owner, if you have that exact scenario, uh, the number of small business owners out there that have gone bankrupt and faced that because of those types of problems or because of small mistakes they made is huge. It's a, it's a significant number, given that so many fail. And so it's you wouldn't have to go far in your own family tree in all likelihood to find a small business owner or somebody that's faced bankruptcy for those types of reasons. That's something that people see and as you start realizing how common it is, they're like, man, I, I bet he did learn some valuable stuff. Maybe that government regulation is really a job killer. Right. Yeah, I, I, it's all about how you package it. So, Eric, kind of kind of circling back around to the book, when when we're looking at this from as conservatives, you know, I desperately believe that we need more conservatives running and preparing to run for office down the line. I know that's something that you're passionate about, but we want to make sure that we're more than just politicians. We want to make sure that we're having a long-term impact in our families, in our churches, in the public square, and then in the policy arena. What's what's your advice for th these guys and these men and women that are thinking about running and how they should be preparing today just to cross that full spectrum? Oh, that is a good question. Uh, and I say that because it's one that I can't immediately mouth off uh, without thinking about for me. <laughs> um, you know, yeah. I think if you're a person of faith who wants to run for office, you, you need to first know that for the first time in American history, the headwinds really are against you. Um, the secular culture is out to get you and they're out. It's out to get your family. And so the question is, how big an issue do you wear your faith on your sleeve? And I think one of the things that particularly a Christian running for office needs to remember these days is that um, – you, your style of campaigning doesn't have to reflect the other people. You, you don't have to get in the gutter with them. Um, but you also, you don't have to wear your Christianity on your sleeve, but show it through how you behave on the campaign trail. Absolutely. Uh, no, I, I listen, look, I'm an evangelical Christian. I'm in seminary right now, and I don't like the the pastor candidates who wear their faith on the sleeve, the 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 Mike Huckabee style candidate who who defines their candidacy based on that. Uh, because I also understand that a politician is sometimes going to do things that they shouldn't do, including the, the pastor candidate. So I'd prefer you not to make that the centerpiece of your campaign. Uh, but you can go out on the campaign trail and be the happy warrior and stick up for people and make your case and be the smiling, happy warrior guy. And I think that resonates with people. And you're not in your face about your faith, but it shows that you really are sincere just by how you live your life on the campaign trail. I think that goes regardless of, of what your your job or your calling is in life. If if we want to be good Christians, if we want to live a Christ-like life, people should be able to tell by the way we live. We shouldn't have to tell them that we're a Christian in order for them to figure that out. We shouldn't have to talk about how much we love Jesus in order for them to say, oh, yeah. I guess, I guess Raz or Eric's a Christian. We should live our lives that way. We should seem different because of the way we carry ourselves and how we act as a result. This is the point on the podcast where I tell the guests that a, a certain dog has decided. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys can't see the video. No, my, uh, my 120 my, pound Great my, Dane is making his appearance, his cameo here on the podcast. My door is closed or mine would be in here trying to get in my lap and uh, at, <laughs> at 60 pounds. 
Absolutely. Well, I think that that's really important for folks to keep those things balanced, to know how to how to incorporate their faith in what they're doing day to day on the campaign trail, and to make sure that they, if you are a Christian, that you maintain that witness because it's a very easy business to lose that in. A lot of people have. Uh, yeah. I know I've said things that I'm not proud of. You've you've said the same thing. It's it's important that we realize we're not going to be perfect, but we should definitely do our best to keep that first and foremost in our in our minds. Yeah, you know, it, one last point on this too, and and I write about this in my book is that. It, in this day and age, people want to define you by the worst thing you've done, and they never want you to be able to live it down. I mean, things that I said and did that I'm not proud of a decade ago are still the things people will bring up and say, you can't listen to that guy. He's got no no authority on this issue because look what he did 10 years ago. Uh, and, you know, I, I my response is always, yes, look at that. I'm an expert on this. <laughs> Oh, well, definitely. It's it's the mistakes that we make that make us wise. And, uh, you know, we should both be a lot smarter than we are given the number of mistakes we make over the years. <laughs> yes. So, Eric, where can folks find you online and buy your book? Uh, they can go to theresurgent.com or, you know, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. It's all E.W. Erickson. Uh, I am not on Snapchat. Uh, we'll never be on Snapchat. Uh, no one has any business being on Snapchat. And if you're on it, get off of it. Um, and it, otherwise they can also go to Amazon or Barnes and Noble. The new book is called before you wake. That's awesome. Well, I'm definitely linked to all those in the Facebook or in on our Facebook page and over in the show notes to the podcast. Uh, Eric, thank you so much for coming on. Do you have any last advice for, uh, for the candidates and staff that are listening? Don't do it unless you really know what you're going to get into. Um, don't don't do it unless you're willing to do it with a good attitude because it's a miserable experience and you're going to eat a heck of a lot of barbecue along the way. <laughs> that and rubber chicken. Well, yes. this is my place to plug. We, we got a free course through mycampaigncoach.com called Are You Prepared to Run for Office? It's an hour long. We got a bunch of questions. We try to help make sure that candidates are doing exactly that, that they're truly assessing and understand what they're getting into, understand should they run? Can they win? Are they prepared? So check that out. Go to mycampaigncoach.com. Uh, you can go straight to our course site with all of our courses at learn.mycampaigncoach.com. Of course, you can follow us on Twitter, My Campaign Coach. You can find us on Facebook. Uh, shoot me an email, raz at mycampaigncoach.com. We love hearing from folks and look forward to getting more feedback. If you got somebody with you think we ought to invite on the podcast, that'd be awesome. Just drop me a line. Eric, thanks for coming on. You can find more of his stuff at theresurgent.com and we'll talk to you guys again next week. Thanks. Please subscribe and rate us on iTunes to help spread the word. We'll be back with you next week with more campaign insights from My Campaign Coach.